Hey friends, it's your buddy Chris again. Uh, so I'm here to teach you guys another lesson. Uh, do you guys remember what is the theme of what we've been learning so far, like from September this year? Uh, what's kind of the idea that we've been working through in Sunday school so far? That's right, it's God's providence. So right now I'm gonna try to say the definition of God's providence that we've learned so far. And if you guys remember it, please say it along with me. Uh, if not, just listen and try to commit it to memory. So this is the definition of God's providence that we have been learning. So God is present and active in all his creation. His eye is watching, his hand is working to uphold and govern all creation, to fulfill all his purposes for his glory. So today we are going to be focusing on that last sentence that is for his glory. God acts for his glory in everything. So let's pray and then let's get on with the lesson. Dear God, thank you so much for today and thank you for being such a glorious God. I just pray, Lord, that as we go through today's lesson that you will reveal your glory to us so that we may be glorifying you in all our actions. Uh, let everything that we say and do be for your glory. We ask all this in your precious almighty name. Well, to start us off, we have a little skit that we'd like for you to see. Uh, so sit back, enjoy. Oh, oh man. This, this poster is just not working. If only I knew someone who could fix it for me. I just don't know how to fix it, but it just doesn't give me toast. I just don't know what to do. Oh man. This toaster is not working. I just want toast, but I can't get toast. If only there was someone who could uh, fix it for me. Oh. I'm the repair woman. What? I could totally help you with that. Really? Because I have all the tools necessary. Uh -huh. Look at me, always ready. And wow. check this out. I am actually certified. I am qualified to help you fix your toaster. What? Let me do that for you. Amazing. Thank you so much. So again, we saw two scenarios. We saw the first scenario where the lady repairwoman was capable of fixing the kettle, but instead she chose to hide her tools, hide her qualifications and not fix the kettle. But in the second scenario, the lady actually shows her qualifications, tells a person who with the broken kettle that she's a repairwoman and she chooses to fix the kettle. So was it, wasn't it wrong for the first repair woman not to help? Like she was capable of fixing it, but she chose not to. Is that not wrong? And in the same way, wasn't it the right thing to do for the repair woman in the second scenario to actually show her qualification, tell the person that she's capable of fixing it and then fixing the kettle? Is this bragging? was what the second person did, was that, was she showing off her qualifications? No, she was merely telling this person that she was capable, she was showcasing that she, it was in her capacity to be able to fix that kettle, and she fixed it. And so, so far, this uh, last couple of months, we've been learning about God's providence. I don't know about you guys, but I think it's so glorious. Would you not agree with me? It has just been phenomenal the way that the Lord functions in his providence. And so why would he want to hide it? Should he hide it? Absolutely not. I think he should display God's providence uh, because it's just so glorious. Like it is, God just displays his glory, his greatness and worthiness because he is glorious and this glory just flows out of him. He's not bragging. I mean, he's, he's showing off his gloriousness because it just flows out of him. He, he's, he's not obnoxious, no, he's literally, he's capable of this and he's just helping us through this by showing his glory. So God wants us to see his greatness so we will know that no one can compare to God. He is the answer to all our longings and needs and he is worthy to be praised. Okay, so now let's look at a story from the Bible where God showcases his glory. We're going to go to the Old Testament. So again, if you guys have your Bible, please take it. It's always good. I've said this before. It's always good to look at the story for yourself. Then you know exactly what the word of the Lord is saying because that is true and that is perfect. So anyway, so we're going to Judges 7 to see the Israelites 
being tormented by the Midianites. The Bible says that the Midianites were oppressing the Israelites and stealing their crops, and their army was too numerous to count, and it literally says they swarmed over Israel like devouring locusts. Like there was just so many of of these Midianite armies that were just coming and attacking the Israelites. And so God picked Gideon to summon an army to go against them. And if you read the story of Gideon just before, um, it talks about how he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was extremely humble and he underestimated his powers. But God chose this humble man who was incapable of leading an army to go pick an army. Well, I get to why God does that. First, we'll see that God makes Gideon pick an army of about 32,000 men. So that's why I have this thing here full of Nerf bullets. <laughs> and so we're going to, this is kind of what 32,000 men would have looked like. Well, I mean, I'm trying to illustrate what 32,000 men would look like. And so um, these many, this many men decided to go and fight against the Midianites, which was already a small number to start with compared to the Midianite army. And so God then reduced them to 10,000 because he asks everyone who's scared. So he told the army, anybody who's scared, go home. You don't have to stay. So if this was 32,000, God reduced them to how many? 10,000. That's right. So uh, I'm going to see if I can reduce it to 10,000. Okay. I think this is, yeah, sure. So he reduced a third of the people remained. The third of the men were like, no, we're going to go. We're going to fight. We're not scared. So 10,000 remained. The thing is, God was not looking for numbers. No, he wanted Israel to see his power. He didn't want Israel to feel like, you know, they were the ones who were going to win the war. It says, lest Israel think they defeated the Midianites by their own strength. No, God did not want that. So you know what he did? He gave them another test. He told them, uh, he told all the men, he told Gideon to tell the men to go drink water at a lake that was flowing nearby. He said, uh, all the men who actually cut the water with their hands and drink, go home. All the men who actually lap the water like dogs, stay. So you know how many men stayed? Remember, it was full. There were 32,000 men to start with, but God told even those men, oh, I'm losing a few balls, and only 300 remained. Only 300 men remained to go fight this army of Midianites, which the Bible says were like locusts and too numerous to count. The best part is at the end, the men did not even fight. God told Gideon to surprise the Midian army surrounding the camp with trumpets. You know, trumpets where you, you know, we play music, trumpets, and cover torches. And when the Israelites blew, blew their trumpets and smashed the jars and they yelled, A sword for the Lord and for Gideon! God caused a panic among the Midianites and they just turned against themselves. They started just attacking themselves. See, God actually delivered them. It wasn't the army, it wasn't the soldiers, it wasn't the number. No, God displayed his glory by delivering the Israelites in such a way. By reducing Israel's army to 300 men, God showed his power. God wanted to show that God was their deliverer. So God was showing Israel who he is. He's a great and powerful God. He was showing Israel that he is the answer to their need. It was not Israel's strength but nor against the Midianites, but rather it was God fighting for them. God wanted Israel to know that he is the deliverer. God wants they wanted them to put their hope in him. And in the same way, by showcasing his glory to us, he wants us to know that he is our deliverer. And he wants us to put our hope in him too. When God shows his greatness, it is a good thing for us as well. God is showing his greatness and his worth continually. And that's what we've been learning so far through God's providence. Hey guys, so we are just going to look at a few more stories of God displaying his glory, glory through his providence. And so if you guys remember, we have these four pictures. We've been looking at these pictures. We see the heart, we see the eye, we see his hand, 
and we see his light, his glory. So I don't know if you guys remember, but uh, maybe you can help me uh, fill these uh, boxes here. So um, the first one is, all things are ordained by God. They were in his mind and will before the beginning of the world. So this is kind of talking about just God's ordinance and everything. And then the second, the eyes, because God has ordained all things, he also foresees all things. God's eye is watching over the universe, seeing today and tomorrow. This symbol kind of shows that God is always watching. And the third one is the hand, which says God's hand is working in the universe. He acts to bring all he has ordained. And finally, God acts in order to be seen. So if you guys remember, this is very synonymous to his, uh, the providence definition that God is provident over all. His eyes are watching, his hands are working, all to bring his purposes into being for his glory. All right, so now we're just going to use this diagram to help us kind of figure out a couple of Bible stories to see how these work. So the first story is the story about the army of Israel threatened by the Philistines. If you remember, that is the story where David kills Goliath with uh, a rock. So basically, this are, there was this giant who was uh, threatening the Israelite army, and the Israelites were super scared. And God sent a little boy called David to come and save the day. So let's put that story uh, in, the, in the context of the four in the definition of the God's providence. All right, so God ordains a conflict between Israel and the Philistines. So we see that God ordains conflict. And we see God sees the conflict and the fear of the people. And so God sees Israel. And God sends David to fight Goliath and gives David perfect aim. So God actually sends David, and that's the work of his hands. And if you remember the story, David takes only five stones and a slingshot. And he's able to take down the giant who was threatening the entire Israelite army. So clearly, it wasn't David's capacity, but rather God's strength, God's glory displayed through David. And so all the earth may know that I, that there is a God in Israel, For Samuel 17, 46. That was just God displaying his glory. The second story is a story of Naaman, who is actually... Uh, uh, he was an army general of the enemy of the Israelites, actually, who had leprosy, but he had a servant girl who knew of Elisha. And so he sends, uh, so this uh, girl tells Naaman to go to Elisha. And so when Naaman goes to Elisha, he says, oh, well, prophet Elisha, I have leprosy. And Elisha asks him to go and dip himself seven uh times in um, in the river, the River Jordan, and at first Naaman rejects it, but then when he actually does it, God's glory is shown, and this man is rid of leprosy. And if you know what leprosy is, leprosy is a skin condition that actually is really hard uh, to live with. Uh, but yeah, so again, let's put that in the context of God's providence. So God ordains leprosy for Naaman. So God ordains, ordains the leprosy. God sees leprosy in the heart condition of Naaman. So you see, God sees Naaman. And God places the Israelite maid in Naaman's house to tell him about Elijah. Oh, I'm sorry, not Elisha. It was Elijah. It was the wrong prophet. Sorry, guys. God heals Naaman when he follows Elijah's instruction. Because God sent the maid to, uh, Eli God sent maid to tell him about Elijah. And behold, I will see that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. That's in 2 Kings 5.15, because we see God's glory through that too. So we've been learning about how God shows off his power, but what is he actually showing off? Like, what is he displaying? He's displaying his glory. When God shows off his glory, he is showing that he is glorious, he's showing his greatness, he's showing his worth. All of God's acts of providence are to show his glory, to show his greatness and worth. I think it's, God is just full of glory that he, as he continues to exist, like you see this cup, oh by the way this is Will, he's one of an amazing, he's an amazing mentor here at uh, the Met. He worked for the youth. But, so if you see him, say hi to him. Anyway, so God is just 
full of glory, that as he exists and works in his providence, just his glory, just like how it, the balls are bouncing off, they just flow out of him. He's just so glorious. And the main reason that God shows off his glory is not to bless us. It's important to remember that he doesn't show off his glory in, you know, in an obnoxious way and not just to bless us. No, it's because he's just filled with the glory that glory just overflows. It just outflows from him. However, he does bless us in the process. So it's good. It, he doesn't, you know, he's not glorious just to bless us, but as his glory just flows out of him, it, it, we get blessed. So that's kind of a cool, <laughs> cool thing uh, that we're able to get. But yes, he is just full of glory. So give me a second. I'm just going to clean up this mess and then we'll continue with the lesson. All right, I'm back. That was fun picking up all those uh, nerf bullets. And so I have one last example of God showing us his glory. And probably is the most glorious uh, thing of all. Uh, see, the thing is God is holy and we are sinners and we're in need of a savior. Like I said before, God wants us to put our hope in him. So God sees that we need help because we cannot save ourselves from our sin because we are just sinful human beings. And that is why out of his love, he sent his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to take our place for our sins on the cross so that we may be saved. So God giving us this salvation is the most glorious thing of all. The most glorious event through history was Christ on the cross. Because through that, we have received the salvation. We have received a way to be children of God again. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that glorious? And when we have instances like this, when we see God's glory, what should our response be? Our response to when we see God's glory is to say, wow, God is great. We should praise him. We should exalt him. We should give him the glory he deserves. We should worship him. We see examples in the Bible where the where people see God's glory and give him glory. Uh, like, for example, if we go to Exodus, if you have your Bibles again, please turn with me to Exodus chapter 15, verse 18. Uh, sorry, verse 9 to 11. It says, uh, so that again, Exodus 15, verses 9 to 11. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake you, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? So this is actually Miriam, Moses' sister, giving God glory after he delivered them from the Israelites. That's what happens. You see how beautiful and how glorious our God is and how she's able to give glory? That should be the same response that we have when we see God's glory. And again, in Exodus 15, 18, uh, she says, the Lord will reign forever and ever. So God acts in order to be seen. And when we see the greatness and worth of God, we see his glory. And if we truly see who God is, our hearts should automatically respond in praise. So let's pray. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. God bless you guys.